thanks to Mother Bishop Bellini for the kind invitation to come for this um, special, important occasion of the ordination to the subdiaconate of Mr. Daniel Duarte from Brazil. Dear fathers, special welcome also to Don Niccolo, parish priest from northern Italy, who is with us for this special occasion also, accompanied by a deacon of his community, Don Andrea, the seminarian's uh, dear faithful. You know how the uh, subdiaconate is the first of the major orders after the preceded by the tonsure and the four minor orders, the subdiaconate is a definitive step towards the priesthood, meaning that once the candidate is ordained subdeacon, there's no going back. It's a point of no return. It's a great blessing and a great grace to be called to serve the Holy Church in the day's time of difficulty and confusion and danger. It's a great blessing to be engaged definitively uh, service of the church uh, and of souls and to fight the good fight in these times when precisely everything is tumbling down around us. So our prayers are with Mr. Daniel Duarte will become Reverend Mr. with his ordination. The ceremony of ordination takes place precisely after the collect, hence the sermon is, is a this strange part, of, strange place in the Mass, I was about to say. And during some of the longer prayers, the monition in particular for this ordination are the words addressed to the candidate, be such as becometh to serve in a distinguished manner the divine sacrifice of the Church, remaining firm in the true Catholic faith, then, because our obligations required at the subdiaconate, daily recital of the divine office, the breviary of uh, celibacy, not getting married, making the sacrifice of, of marriage and the family, also serving closely at the altar, assisting the deacon, uh, taking care also of the sacred linens on the altar, not least when they are purified. And these sacred linens, it's interesting to note here, faithful, represent you in fact, they represent the members of the church, and hence the office of the subdeacon is not just a material one, it's also to take care of the faithful by preaching the truth, by his uh, example, by being firm to the true Catholic faith. We have around the corner, not physically here in court, but just in the next few days and weeks, this synod going on, uh, which is another revolution in the church, that, uh, bringing democracy to the church, false democracy, and introducing such things as blessings for homosexual couples, um, giving power to the, to the laity in the worst possible sense, and all this in the name and in the line of Vatican II. So heaven help us, my dear faithful. Hence the importance of remaining firm in the true Catholic faith. Today's consideration, which will be not perhaps too brief, because you've come a long way, and I congratulate you and commend you, you're coming from different parts of the country, from, from Derry, from Dublin, from Longford, no doubt from other parts of the country also, not to mention Italy and of course Mr. Duarte from Brazil. Uh, the words about the, the position, the situation, the state of the church towards the end times, towards the end times. And these words are taken in fact from, in fact, from Saint Pope, Saint Gregory the Great, uh, and they're passed on by a famous and saintly French priest of the 19th century by name Père Emmanuel Marie, who a bit like the Saint Curie d'Arsen, converted by the grace of God, a 
and the prayers of our Blessed Lady at whom we've consecrated his parish, small parish of 300 souls. And both of his parish founded two small, small, small monasteries and was a great defender of the church against the liberal and modern errors. And he was in this uh, a combatant in arms with Monsignor de Segor, with Monsignor Gaume, with uh, Cardinal P and, and others. And it's interesting how in his commentary upon the Old Testament book of Job, he, uh, I'm talking here about St. Gregory the Great, but cited, taken again by uh, Marie, shows us the events which we seem to be living. St. Gregory the Great, as you'll recall, dear faithful, lived at the end of the 6th century and the beginning of the 7th century. And a great commentator on Holy Scripture, as being also a great doctor of the church, but also himself imbued with a prophetic, not pathetic, prophetic spirit. When he also seeing things which would come. And uh, revealing these things, illustrating these things, with his, his commentaries upon Holy Scripture. And so it is that he contemplates the church at the end of time, towards the end of time, under the figure of Job, humiliated and suffering. We all know the story of Job, the powerful man, uh, the rich man, the thousands of camels and goats, and many children, and revered and esteemed. And when Satan said to Almighty God, well, it's easy for him to be good and nice and prayerful because he's got everything. Send him trials, temptation, illness, and, and then we'll see. And Almighty God allows this, and Job, being despoiled of uh, his possessions, his animals, his camels, his children, uh, uh, through, through accidents and death, and then himself afflicted by an awful sort of leprosy type disease. And yet he continued being faithful to Almighty God when those around him criticize Almighty God, blame Job, and all the rest of it. The Church says St. Gregory the Great, towards the end of her pilgrimage upon earth, will be deprived of all temporal power. And we're certainly at this point in time, dear faithful. When you think that since Vatican II, there are no Catholic states left in the world. The few remaining states, by virtue of the decree on false religious liberty, were made to abandon their Catholic constitutions, the name of liberty and freedom for all religions, placing the true religion on the same footing as false religions. And, and so the situation is that no states are left, no countries, no nations are left in the world which profess a blessed Lord as their king and the Catholic faith as the true faith Catholic Church as the true religion. And that's where we think, we can think that uh, this time in the, uh, the, the Church, and that state at the end of time, has arrived because the Church no longer has any temporal support, um, um, recognition, Catholic uh, nations behind her. St. Gregory says that this, the Church, will be despoiled of her glory which come from her supernatural gifts the power of miracles he says will be uh, withdrawn the grace of healings will be taken away the gift of prophecy will have disappeared uh, the gift of a long abstinence will be diminished uh, self-denial, suffering, uh, Lent and uh, fasting and abstinence and all those uh, healthy signs of the Catholic life. The teachings of true doctrine will become quiet, and alas, it's not modern Rome, uh, which is going to these days uh, preach the, the true faith and, and denounce the errors uh, of post of the faith. That's not to say that there will be nothing of these things, but these signs, these qualities of the church are no longer no longer be so apparent uh, as they were in the first stages of the church. Uh, 
In this humiliated state of the church, however, the reward of the good, and we pray to God to be amongst the good, the reward of the good will, will be all the greater because they'll be attached, the good will be attached to the church purely in view of heavenly rewards and not through temple gain, because there's no temple gain to be had by being faithful Catholics these days, you know full well. As regards the bad, seeing no longer any temporal benefits in being Catholics, they will have nothing left, but nothing more to disguise, and they'll show themselves as they are without faith. And hence we live at the time of the great apostasy, so many falling away from the faith. The church will continue, however, to speak, but her teaching will be silent, but never silent. Her voice will be much reduced, but never let her disappear. Those who should shout from the rooftops will no longer dare to do so because of fear. Fear for the results, the consequences, coming from the hands of men. An example of this to your faithful is Archbishop Legado, we know of, and we have seen, who has been condemned just recently by the French state for having became Catholic marriage, the Catholic family, having denounced the modern perversions against the Catholic family life and marriage and so on. And in a document where other ecclesiastics are also named, uh, as well as um, important um, writers and speakers and, and, and Catholic um, commentators. One of the motives given for the condemnation of Archbishop Vigano and a Catholic movement in France called Civitas is that he wants to restore the reign of Christ the King. So there you go, you see. Catholic Archbishop denounced, condemned, we shall see where all this leads, because it preaches the Catholic faith and denounces the perversions which undermine Catholic life and morality quite simply. But those who should preach the faith, they are silent. So it really often comes back to us this, this following point, that in the church there are three categories of, 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 of faithful, of persons, faithful and worthy together, in fact. The first, and these are not precisely in a, in a special order, the first are those who are hypocrites or false Christians. The second category are the weak. And the third are those who are strong. Or, in these times of uh, anguish, uh, the hypocrites will lift their masks, they will no longer, and they will, they will manifest their secret apostasy. And it's the time of the great apostasy. The weak, and of course we are all weak, will perish in great number. And the heart of the church will be afflicted. However, the strong, or tell us about the strong, which we want to be amongst the strong, we want to be strong in the faith, we pray, we have the faith all time. What about the strong? What's going to happen to them? Many of the, of the strong, too confident in their own strength, will fall away like the stars from heaven. It's not very encouraging, is it, you'd say? Give us, something, give us a happy ending, Bishop, because we came here to have some consolation and encouragement. Well, the second of the three points in this discourse very mighty well, is that in spite of the terrible scandals of the times of perdition towards the end of the life of the, of the, of the world and the church, we mustn't believe that <coughs> the, the weak souls will all be necessarily lost. Some will be cost of presumption, but the way of salvation will always remain open and salvation will remain possible to all. I think about in times of COVID when people came to the true faith because they saw through the smokescreen of the propaganda, restrictions, 
um, the confinements and so on of the, of the whole COVID um, nonsense. Uh, the grace of God is always there. And in times of difficulty, the grace of God, so to speak, can even be stronger. This church will still have, will always have the means of, 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 of uh, preservation proportionate to the greatness of the dangers. The greater the dangers, the greater the means of preservation. Only those amongst the weak, the small, will fall who will have left the wings of their mother through teaching, prayer, uh, the sacraments, um, tradition, will have gone along with novelties or just with the convenience of the moment or thought that we don't really need God because the modern world is so comfortable. What will be the means of preservation in these, in these times? Well, the scriptures give us indications of the, on this subject. Uh, the church during these times will remember the warning given by our blessed Lord at the time for the, the, the announcing prophesied, prophesied, mix of French here, giving the prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, warning applicable also to the last times. And that's why, by the way, in Advent, coming up quite quickly now, and the first uh, couple of, uh, last end of the year, the first end of Advent, you have the rather strange gospel which talks about which talks about um, destruction of Jerusalem and the general judgment and the events preceding the general judgment, precisely because the two events, uh, one illustrates the other. <clears throat> when you see the abomination of the desolation predicted by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, then those who are in Judea should flee towards the mountains. Fly, uh, pray that your flight will not take place in winter, nor on the Sabbath, because there will be such a great tribulation, such as the world has never seen. So it was not just applied to the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. It's in regards to besides the end of time, uh, the end of the, the, the times, towards the end of time. If these days were not uh, abrogated, diminished, nobody would be saved. But because of the elect, there will be, um, there will be abbreviated. It will be shortened. Hence, conf uh, conforming to the instructions of our, of our divine Saviour, the Church will assure the safe flight of the faithful, especially the weak amongst the faithful, and will find for them an accessible place of refuge, where the beast announced the apocalypse will not devour them, will not afflict them. They can ask, where will where will these places be? And in the interesting this article written in the, in, in the 1880s, long before computers and things. Uh, Perry Manuel talks about the earth world at this time will be um, full of uh, means of communication whereby people will be found out, discovered, trapped wherever they go. And of course, we all know with our portable phones and um, satellites and GPS and um, uh, facial imaging and artificial intelligence that whatever they, we are, whatever we're doing, we, we are certainly known and followed by the authorities. The answer to the question is how will the church find us places of safe refuge is that Almighty God will himself provide to the security of the fugitives. An interesting example in fact um, uh, in the in the first century, the tradition is that just before the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, our blessed Lord Himself appeared to the early Christians and said, "Flee and go to a place called Pella, that is about thirty or forty miles to the east of uh, Judea in Transjordania, 
and there the early Christians lived in relative peace for about 50 years mm -hmm. before returning to Jerusalem. Another example also, by this time in the 8th century, for those of you who have been on holiday to Turkey in happier times possibly, given troubles in the Middle East, uh, in central Turkey there's a place called Cappadocia. And in Cappadocia you have 36 underground cities. And some cities are still being discovered in our own times. And to these cities, the Christians also took refuge for some 300 years due to the Islamic persecution. And you can visit these places with their churches, with their wine presses, with their alleyways, their rooms, their bakeries, their habitations, and so on. And so it was that the faithful were preserved until peace came back to the church. <coughs> In the book of the Apocalypse, it's chapter 12 this time, the church is represented as a woman uh, clothed with the sun and crowned with stars. This woman suffers the um, pains of childbirth because the church uh, gives birth to God, the elect, but with great suffering. And in front of this woman, representing the church, is the red dragon, image of the devil, and of his continual, his continual ploys to ensnare souls. The woman, the church, flees into the solitude into a place prepared, says the Apocalypse, by Almighty God Himself. And there the church and the faithful and the weaker souls will be nourished for three and a half years. The three and a half years correspond to precisely the time of the persecution and the Antichrist. Almighty God will take care of the church and the, and the weak souls, will help her to be hidden and will nourish the church. The dragon pursues the woman, the church, and from his mouth gushes water to drown the woman. But the earth comes to the woman's assistance and, and uh, soaks up uh, the flood of water. These mysterious words designate some great marvel which Almighty God will perform in favour of his church and the rage of the dragon will expire at uh, her feet. What will the faith the, the faithful the weak faith will be doing during this time in hiding? They'll be praying, be praying for the church, whilst the strong and the courageous will be engaged in a formidable battle visible to the whole world with the dragon and against the Antichrist. The third and last point, dear faithful, is that without a doubt there will be in this day, in these last times, saints of an heroic uh, virtue. In the beginning, Almighty God gave to his church the apostles who vanquished, who overcame the idolatry of the empire and who cemented Christian life in their blood. At the end of time, Almighty God will give to the church great defenders, great saints, uh, equal to, compatible to the great apostles and uh, great saints of the early times. Uh, Almighty God will also give to the church soldiers who will be prudent and strong, who will be able with wisdom to see through the tricks and the snares of the devil, and who will suffer with patience the assaults of their enemy, their enemy this time unchained. St. Augustine says regarding these times, will there still be conversions in these times of perdition? 
will there still be baptisms? Now, if we, if it is, um, despite the prohibitions of the monster, will the saints, the strong, have the power to save souls from the furious dragon? And the great Dr. St. Augustine this time replies affirmatively to all these questions. Without a doubt, the conversions will be more there, but they'll be all the more um, wonderful, all the more marvellous. In these times, these last times, the mighty God will delight, so to speak, to show that His grace is stronger than the evil one, even when released, so to speak, from the chains of hell at this time of trial. So let each person, says uh, St. Gregory the Great, notice how that will be great consolations. So there is something of a happy ending in all of, the, all, of all of this. Because of the great saints, the courageous soldiers, the church being protected, the weak being supported, um, marvellous and surprising conversions, Amongst the saints of the last ages, there will be soldiers. The Antichrist will come as a conqueror. He will command armies. But he will find himself opposed by the Vian legions. Remember St. Maurice and his legions there in Switzerland. Not far from a code, in fact, Lake Geneva. Some 6,000 Roman soldiers, Christians, and they were told to persecute and put to death the local Christians there in the, I want to say, end of the 3rd century, beginning of the 4th century, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and they said, no, we will not. We are Christians. We will die for the faith. They were armed. They couldn't afford. They didn't. They gave themselves up um, as a glorious army, publicly, publicly opposing the paganism of the empire. In these times, in this last time, there will be the legions, there will be uh, soldiers and armies in the glorious uh, tradition and heritage of the Maccabees, who will number amongst, amongst the ranks of uh, crus crusaders as the days gone by. Those who have opposed the revolution in more recent times, the Vandians in France or the Tyrol, also the Pontifical Zwarza. These soldiers, uh, he can and will try to crush, but they will not flee. They will not flee. The Antichrist, in conclusion, will most of all be an imposter. Consequently, he will encounter, as principal adversaries, apostles armed with the crucifix. Now, as the last persecution will take on the aspect of a seduction, uh, these uh, apostles armed with the crucifix uh, will have the patience of martyrs, the science of doctors, and Saint our Lord showed these uh, apostles of the last time was one day to Saint Teresa, holding in their hands uh, luminous swords. And the head of these intrepid armies, Catholic armies, and these armies to defend the church, will be two great, extraordinary envoys sent from God, and this will be for another occasion, another sermon, another conference, Enoch and uh, Elias. So be faithful. Why talk about these things now? Because we may well be living in these times. In any event, it's good to know precisely what the great saints say about the church, her life, her sufferings, and her resurrection in the end. We are certainly not uh, in times of, uh, of um, when, when, the when the faith is triumphant, on the very contrary. And none of us are immune from the influences of the evil one, uh, of the modern world, seduction, the Antichrist and his satellites. Uh, and hence, later in the uh, work which I'm quoting from, the great uh, um, advice given will be 
the words of our blessed Lord to the apostles as they were falling asleep, huh? Watch and pray. Watch and pray. If you're faithful on this first on this Saturday, we're going to give to our blessed lady. Please ask her for this discernment, for this courage, for this pray for our new to be subdeacon. Uh, soon to be Reverend Mr. Uh, Duarte. As he enters in precisely to this um, into this combat in a very real sense. Uh, may we have confidence in God's grace. May we be humble and vigilant and prayerful. Uh, today, Saint, uh, the last word, the last words tend to drag, drag out sometimes, is Saint Hilarion, Hilarion, who came from Gaza, from Gaza. And we see in our very own times how Gaza, uh, the Holy Landers, uh, and so on, uh, a place of great struggle, uh, the, the combat there, the war there, with awful atrocities on both sides, uh, could spiral out of control. And it's not for nothing these things are taking place uh, in the very land of our blessed Lord, uh, because besides the warfare in our present times and the warfare in the time will be a theological war between precisely the forces of evil against Almighty God. These events, Gaza, St. Clair, remind, remind us of the situation of the world and hopefully will help us not to fall asleep but remain vigilant uh, and prayerful and hopeful. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, uh, Amen.